Okay. These are going to be your notes on embryology in general, and then at the end we will get into a little more specifics in terms of vertebrates, but here's overall embryology. So first of all, the definition. So embryology, you should be familiar with the term embryo, which is a developing organism. So embryology is the study of the develop development of that organism from the fertilization until all major organ systems are formed, which is usually at birth is when all of that is ready. So there's a few things that happened before we came to our modern day conclusion about embryology. So these are a couple of the historical aspects of it. So first was this idea of preformation. So note the time of time of our lives here. So 17th, early 18th century, it stated that the sex cells were they basically had like mini humans in them. So like your egg cells had a mini human and then it just grew, which we know is not true. Then going into the mid 18th century, the egg had material and it formed some individual, but they still weren't really sure how this happened. Then we have two other experiments. So we have an experiment with amphibian eggs here in 1888, and then in 1892, we have an experiment with echinoderm eggs, which are your starfish. And these are experiments that we'll explore a little more in class, so I'm not going to get into them on this, on these notes. So here's just kind of an idea of what an embryo looks like as it's being fertilized. So you have here, it's dividing, so we have our four cells, and then it separates into four cells. So this is the early idea. So definitions of embryonic development now. So we have something called a gamete. This is your sex cell. There's male gametes and female gametes. So the sperm is the male gamete, usually much smaller. I think we're all familiar with the differences in size than the female gamete. And they're much produced much more. So there's many more produced. And as you know, men can produce them their entire lives, whereas females only have a certain window of time. Um, the egg, or the ovum, is the female gamete, and this is non-mobile, so the sperm can move, the egg can't, and it's a th thousand times larger than a sperm cell, okay, and they're both haploid, like is noted, and they do, these contain the enzymes for the embryo, so the sperm is fertilizing the egg, and the egg essentially becomes the embryo with the sperm in it, so the egg has to have a lot more information than a sperm cell. So fertilization is simple, union of sperm and egg. This becomes diploid, so you know that in humans there's 23 chromosomes in a male and 23 in a female, and we get 46 in our baby. And then zygote is the cell that's produced from this union of sperm and egg. So an egg and a sperm is known as a zygote. So here's a little bit more of an anatomy of a sperm cell. So you have a nucleus and then some cytoplasm. It's a pretty simple simple thing. There's a head, a middle, and a tail. So the tail is the flagella. That's a pretty common term for a tail as with other protists and small organisms. So that should not be a new term. The middle section has all the mitochondria for the energy to help move it. And then the head has the material needed to penetrate that egg cell because the egg isn't just out there. It's protected because it doesn't necessarily want to be fertilized. So the strongest sperm will get through and fertilize the egg. Here's just an example of a karyotype. So as you can see, this one has 23 pairs of chromosomes, or 46, so this is a human karyotype. And we see the XY, which means it's a male. XX would be female. So there's some steps in this embryonic development. So the first step is going to be your fertilization. So pretty simple if you think about it. The sperm has to penetrate the egg. This is the first step. So there's a gel coating that's on this egg, and then the enzymes that we just talked about in the diagram of the sperm cell dissolve this gel coating. So whichever sperm can get there first is going to start trying to dissolve the coating to get into the egg cell. And as we'll find out later, once one sperm gets in, lots of changes occur very quickly. So the second step is going to be the egg activation. So this is after the acrosome, which is the head part, of the sperm fuses with the egg membrane. So the egg goes through early changes very, very quickly to make sure only one sperm is fertilizing the egg. There'd be a lot of problems if you had more than one sperm going into the egg. 
So the sperm immediately gets surrounded by a microvilli here. Then the nucleus of the sperm is drawn into the egg center, as we can see in this picture down here. Within milliseconds, notice how quick that is, the membrane is unresponsive to any other sperm. So this goes back to ensuring that only one sperm can fertilize the egg cell. Then a membrane actually forms around the egg, which prevents the other sperm from entering as well, which is this milliseconds here. Is, that's how that happens. So, and then in some species, there's also something called a gray crescent that forms on the opposite side of penetration by the sperm cell. So here's just a visual of what it looks like when fertilization is occurring kind of step by step. And we will be sketching this in class. That way you know the different parts of fertilization. So step three is going to be your metabolic and nuclear events. So mRNA should not be a new term. Maternal mRNA is what's in the egg cell. Actually, in your body, whether you're male or female, your RNA came from your mother because it's present in the egg cell not the sperm. So the reason also, as you see, why the egg is so much larger because it has all this maternal mRNA. So this directs protein synthesis, which as you know, makes proteins. You should be able to figure that one out during the early development of this embryo. And the DNA only replicates. So the DNA does not turn into RNA. The RNA is already there. So the DNA is there and the RNA is there, but there's no DNA to RNA going on. So make sure you remember that. And then there's two major regions of the egg. There's the animal pole, which has less yolk, more mitochondria, ribosomes. It's more active. This is your active side. If you look, this is the blue part of this cell over here. The vegetal pole, this has all the yolk, which is food for the growing embryo and it's less active. So if you notice, it kind of looks a little more blobby. This is that part. So the fourth step is the cleavage and the egg types. Now this step has a lot of information and a lot of different things that happen depending on what the organism is. So first, a couple definitions. So cleavage is what results from cytokinesis. So if you remember, plant cells form a cell plate, animal cells form a cleavage furrow. But something that you didn't get into in biology is all the different types of cleavage that occur depending on the organism. Your blastomeres are the cells that result from this division that comes from the cleavage. And then the yolk, is you should be kind of familiar with this in terms of if you ever eat eggs from a chicken. But the yolk for the developing embryo, if you look, has all of these things in it. So look at everything that's in there, lipids, glycogen, proteins, carbs, other organic compounds, food to feed the, feed the baby as it's growing. And then the term synchrony is the simultaneous division of cells. Sorry, that arrow should be pointing this way. The simultaneous division, if someone's in sync or a synchronized swimming team, it's all going at the same time. So think about that when you think of simultaneous division. So cleavage patterns. So he, there's two here, and then we'll get into a couple more. So there's the holoblastic cleavage. This is dividing into two equal daughter cells. Cells that do this have very little yolk, and they have a central nucleus. So this here is a picture of holoblastic cleavage. Then you have your meroblastic cleavage. These are egg cells that have lots of yolk, but they have an unequal division. They only divide at one end of the cell. So if you look down here, something like a frog. If you notice, look at how lopsided the division is. We also have spiral cleavage and radial cleavage. So this we've kind of gone over a little bit. Spiral cleavage occurs at obtuse angles. So hopefully you remember what obtuse means from math class. This is typical of your lower invertebrates. So these are going to be things that don't have backbones. Um, your higher invertebrates, on the other hand, do radial cleavage, so it occurs at right angles to each other. So if we pay attention to the picture, radial cleavage is the top one, spiral cleavage is the bottom picture. Notice how different they look as they're developing, even at the eight cell stage, how different they look from each other. There's also two types of development, so determinate development and indeterminate development. So determinate development, they become specialized by the four cell stage. By the four cell stage, they know exactly what they're going to be, what they're going to be doing in the body. This, once again, is in your lower invertebrates. Indeterminate development, on the other hand, 
The cells become specialized much later. These are what you might typically know as stem cells. This is going to be your higher invertebrates and your vertebrates. So the, all these other terms are terms you might see as you're reading or coming across things, but these definitely just remember stem cells are these unspecialized cells. So the steps of embryonic development as we continue in this fourth step. So here are your embryo development steps. So the, the zygote divides to become two, then the two become four, four become eight, etc. That I think we're all pretty good on. Next, this hollow ball of fluid-filled cells forms, which is known as a blastula. So it's hollow. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, the blastula cells, some of them begin to grow inward, which forms this double wall structure. Gastrula is what this is referred to, this double wall. The growth then creates an opening called a blastopore. This new cavity, don't worry, I know these are lots of new terms, is the archenteron. So this is going to be the cavity formed inside this original blastula that's forming up here, okay? Then you have an outer layer of cells, which is your ectoderm. Inner layer is endo. Remember, ecto means out. Endo means in. So inside layer, outside layer. And then this is kind of just showing this in a step-by-step. -step. So you have one cell, it becomes two, it becomes four, it becomes eight, it keeps going, going, going. Now look, notice your growth inward as that's happening. If we go back to the slide, you know that that inward growth is a blastopore. Okay, the double wall is the gastrula. So we see a gastrula here. And then the blastopore starts at number nine. And eventually you have this entire opening that forms. And as we'll learn in a minute, it becomes more specialized depending on the organism. So now to the germ layers. And we've touched on this in your previous video notes. So really quick review. Your ectoderm, like I said, ecto means out. Okay, you have your nervous tissue, your epidermis. Think about your skin, your nails, hair. You don't have fur, but teeth, etc. Anything that's on this, like the outside of your skin or close to it, those are going to be things that come from the ectoderm. And then your skin sensory organs, so nerves, sweat glands, those are still considered ectoderm. Then you have your endo, which endo means in. This is your gut tract lining, your respiratory lining, digestive glands, pancreas, liver. Think about this as like your very, when you're first forming, you form from this endoderm, that inner tissue. So your gut digestion, just when you think of endoderm, think of digestion and think of all the things that are involved in that process. Next you have the mesoderm, which meso means middle. This is everything in between. All those connective tissues, muscles, the notochord of chordates, which leads to your vertebrae and your spine. It forms from the mesoderm as well. You have a dermis, which is your inner layer of skin. Like when people get really severe burns, they burn through their epidermis into their dermis. Then your excretory organs and your reproductive organs are all from this middle layer of tissue. So two patterns of development. So you have protostomes and deuterostomes, and we've done some with this, so this should not be a new term for you. So protostomes, the blastopore, which remember is that opening, becomes the mouth. It has spiral determinate cleavage, an ectodermal skeleton, which means the, skin, the skeleton comes from the ectoderm. So these are going to be organisms that have their, their protection of their body structure on the outside, such as mollusks and arthropods. Your deuterostomes, on the other hand, the blastopore, that opening becomes the anus. It has radial indeterminate cleavage, and this is a mesodermal skeleton produced from the mesoderm. So these are echinoderms, which are your starfish. They're a little rare because they have similar characteristics of vertebrates, and then all of your chordates. So this is us. Not the echinoderms, but you know what I mean. All right, so here's just a picture of patterns of development. So if you see, this is stage one, stage two, stage three. Notice how similar everybody looks in this stage. Then you start getting some specialization as we go through here until finally this final stage, look how different everything is. But at the beginning, it all kind of started the same. So then how are chordates different? So there's a formation of this hollow tube after gastrulation. This hollow tube ends up being where the chordate part of your structure comes from. So there's a term used for this called neurulation. 
And this occurs after invagination of the ectoderm. Invagination means it folds in, as you can see in this picture here. So avian and reptile embryology then, you know these are both vertebrates, and then both of these groups undergo a meroblastic development, which means lots of yolk divide at one end. It's unequal, so you can flip back to that picture to look at that. And they have a true egg with several protective membranes. <coughs> Now, we're going to go through this in class as well, but here's just a list of these types of membranes. You do need to know what they are and what they do. So all of these things, I would pause this and just write these down and then compare it to, this is going to be the labeled picture of all of those things. So you have your yolk, your yolk sac, you can see the shell, the amniotic cavity, all of those things are all in here. And we will get into this much more in class. You'll do some more work with this, but this is it for your notes.